this is episode three of Jonah chapter two. So here's Jonah over here, uh, over here. He's amongst Amos and Hosea. The three of them were, were contemporaries and all preaching to Israel, uh, Israel, yes, the northern kingdom at the same time. So here's the United Kingdom under King Saul, David, and Solomon. And then it's split up under Rehoboam into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. And here's Jonah over here preaching to the southern, uh, sorry, the northern kingdom. And also this is, uh, Jonah is uh, four chapters on God telling him to go to Nineveh and preach to the Assyrians. So the Assyrian Empire was the enemy of the Northern Kingdom and Israel's greatest threat. And Jonah was tasked with warning Nineveh, their capital city, of their wickedness. So this is how they fit in. I think this is a great picture. So the layout of Jonah illustrates the key theme, the relentless love of God. We did chapter 1, where Jonah's disobedience, where he runs away, God's patience with Jonah. Chapter 2, God answers Jonah's prayer because now he's sitting in a fish. And God's mercy towards Jonah, his salvation, when he's vomited onto dry land. Chapter 3, Jonah preaches to Nineveh and God's power through Jonah. And chapter 4, Jonah's displeasure and God's ministry to Jonah. God obviously has to tell Jonah some lessons. So, repeating chapter 1, verse 17. So now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So in a report by M. de Pavel, editor of the Journal de Debat, he writes that in February 1891, James Bartley, a whaler, was lost at sea while chasing a sperm whale. The crew subsequently harpooned and killed the whale, only find two and a half days later, Bartley was still inside, unconscious and alive. Asked how long he could have lived, he replied, until I starved. He recovered in three weeks and resumed his duties. However, his skin was bleached white like parchment and his body was entirely devoid of any hair. And here's the story about it in the newspaper. In 1927, the Princeton Review on pages 633 and 642, when I went and read it, reported that a man was found inside a whale. He had been there for two days, was unconscious but alive. And I went to read it, and this sounds very much like the Bartley story. They just don't say his name, but it sounds exactly like that. In fact, when I reviewed this Bartley story, it had been reprinted over the decades about 30-something times. So this is obviously was a very rare event, um, and every felt and every publication felt that they should print it again. So more recently, in October 2023, the Boston 25 News reported that a local lobsterman was swallowed and spit out by a humpback whale off Cape Cod. Michael Packard was out diving for lobsters off Race Point of Provincetown in the morning of June 11, 2021, when he was pulled into the whale's mouth while it was feeding. About 30 seconds later, Packard said the humpback spit him out again. What a shock. So the reason I put this here was because, you know, when I'm doing these... Uh, de- uh, <laughs> Uh, I had to laugh. I, see when I, I told a friend I was doing a deep dive into Jonah and he burst out laughing and he said, did you just hear what you said? So when I'm doing this deep dive, I ask God to uh, help me and to give me any revelations that I haven't had before um, and to make me think differently so that I can, so that I can uh, you know, bring something new and understand something that I didn't understand before. And when I woke up and I started praying about it and saying, God, please help me, um, he reminded me of the whale shark, which is a great fish. Um, I was in Mexico. I was anchored in a bay on my boat, and a, a, a friend anchored nearby called me on the radio and said, hey, do you know there's a whale shark in the bay? So I said, no, I don't. So he said, well, grab your swimsuit. Let's go. So I jumped into my swimsuit, grabbed my, my snorkel gear, and when he arrived in his dinghy, this isn't me. When he arrived in his dinghy, um, I jumped in and off we went looking for this whale shark. And eventually we did find it, but it was out in the open sea. It had swum out the bay and into the open ocean. So we found it, but at the same time, so did a whole lot of tourist boats. So we were all dashing after this thing. And it was leisurely just swimming along, maybe three knots. I mean, it really was a basically slow jogging speed, you know, a human jogging speed. The thing was like 40 to 45 foot long. I mean, that's the size of a four-story building. And so we were paralleling it slowly about 80 to 100 feet away from it. Everybody keep their, keeping their distance. 
But then, and, I, and, and so my friend said, well, get in the water and have a look. You've got to snorkel gear. And it was swimming very shallow. It wasn't like this deep down. It was very, very shallow. It was right near the, the surface of the water. So with a lot, you know, I don't, I don't mind being on the sea in my boat, but I really don't like being under the sea. And so it took a lot of encouragement, which involved him yelling at me and shoving, and eventually I was pushed over the side and into the water. And I was hanging onto the, the line you know, these, of, the, of the dinghy and draped in the water, and I stuck my head underwater, and I could see this huge, huge whale shark swimming leisurely along. But then apparently what happened was a tourist boat got in front of it, and when all the tourists saw the, the, the whale shark coming, they jumped into the water in front of it, and it got a fright, and it veered around, and it turned. But now it was coming straight at me. And honestly, this, this mouth is so wide that if I stretched my hands open, as, my arms as open as wide as I could, I couldn't have touched from end to end. And of course, with that mouth and the eyes back like that, he doesn't see that great. So he was coming straight at me, and when he was only about six foot away, and I realized he hadn't seen me, I let off a squawk into my, my snorkel, and he turned his head, and now I was looking at the huge eyeball. And it obviously took one look at me and decided I was no threat at all, so it just kept coming. And now it had me squashed up against the dinghy, so this huge, huge animal had me fish, actually, because this whale shark is a fish. I mean, a whale is a mammal, but a whale shark is a fish. This huge fish had me crunched up against the dinghy. So I let go of the dinghy, and I used both my hands to try and push it away and, and to try and get some space between me and the dinghy. And it just kept coming and coming. And my hands all the way down his body, and my hands were pushing him away and pushing him away and pushing him away. And, of course, now I'm waiting for this 10-foot tail to come past. And I thought, if he swishes that thing and squashes me against the dinghy, I'm dead. But it didn't, it just uh, it just kept coming and it just drifted past me with my hands all the way down its body. I don't know what it thought as it felt my hands going all the way down its body. And it and it drifted off and left me quite stunned. And, you know, anybody that's trying to get into one of these dinghies from the water, it's almost impossible because these blown up pontoons, you just can't get the leverage out the water and back into the dinghy. Well, let me tell you, I was, my adrenaline was pumping so hard with this thing going right past me like that, that I practically levitated out the water and back into that dinghy. So the reason I'm telling you this is because um, God said, you know, I say in the Bible, I tell in the story, it was a great fish. And, we, you know, from youngsters, I've been programmed that it was a whale. But what if it wasn't? What if it was a whale shark? That's a great fish. So from now on, I think I'm going to think of a whale shark eating Jonah, not so much a whale. Anyway, that was a detour. So let's dive into chapter 2. As my friend said, deep dive into <laughs> Jonah and the fish. Jonah's repentance. Verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Then Jonah. It's interesting that the book of Jonah continues throughout to refer to Jonah in the third person, even though biblical scholars agree that Jonah himself wrote this book of Jonah. Chapter 2 is mostly the study of a prayer, a very heartfelt prayer made by a man in despair in desperate straits. Jonah knew his Bible because his prayers are made up of snatches of 10 different psalms, and here they are, and I've repeated each psalm when I get to each verse. Verse 2, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. I cried out to the Lord. Some people get hung up on the past and present tense used in the prayer because Jonah is still in the belly of the fish in the present tense, but he writes in the past tense. Why? Obviously, this is because Jonah is reliving his experience as he wrote this book after the fact. Obviously, he wasn't writing the book in the belly. Now, Jonah is finally praying. In chapter 1, he couldn't or wouldn't pray, but now he is. So Psalm 121 is, In my distress I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. And he answered me. Prayer is very much a back and forth thing. We pray, we listen, and God answers. Here Jonah is crying out to God, begging for an answer. Why all of a sudden does he want to hear God's voice? He's been on the run, but now God has him in a place where there's nowhere to run. Now that Jonah is in trouble, God has his complete attention. Jonah is forced to face his God and to pray and submit and end his rebellious spirit. Finally, and most importantly, 
he has to listen. Out of the belly of Sheol. Did Jonah really die in the belly of a fish? Yes, he did. Did Jesus really die on the cross? Yes, he did. This Hebrew word Sheol is the word for hell, not the grave. The grave word is Kepha. Sheol is the word for the domain of departed spirits, or Hades in the Greek. The grave is the destination for the body, however the departed soul goes to Sheol. The difference of Sheol Hades versus Kepha the grave is Sheol is always spoken of as under the earth or underworld. Graves are above the earth or in caves. Kepha can be pluralized, like you can have many graves, but Sheol is never pluralized. A grave is located at a specific site. Sheol is never localized. You can go to Hades wherever you die. So whether you die in Europe or die in Africa, you're going to the same place. One can purchase a grave site. Sheol is never spoken of as being bought or sold. You can own a grave as your personal property. Nowhere is Sheol owned by man. Bodies are unconscious in the grave. Those in Sheol are conscious. So Hades appears to be divided into two places where the righteous and wicked are separated. One is unhappy hell where the bad souls wait and the other is paradise where the good souls wait. They were both held in Hades and there was a chasm between them that they couldn't cross. After Jesus was crucified, he went to Hades and collected all the souls in paradise and took them with him to heaven when he resurrected. Since then, Hades is just one place, hell. According to the book of Revelation, after 1,000 years of peace, both the good and bad souls will stand before the great white throne of judgment. Thereafter, the bad guys will be thrown into the lake of fire, which in Hebrew is Gehenna. So Sheol is not Kephar, is not Gehenna. If you're interested, other words are Abuso, which is Hebrew for the abyss or the bottomless pit, where Satan is bound for the thousand years of peace and Tartarus, where the fallen angels are incarcerated and temporarily released in Revelation. So biblical scholars have done extensive studies on these five words, Sheol, Kiva, Gehenna, Abuso, and Tartarus. You don't want to be in any one of these five places. And I've never done a study on this, and I have no desire to. I explain all of this in order to defend the view that Jonah died, because he says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, he died. Then he was resurrected by God and spat out on the beach. Psalm 18.5, the sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. So he was dead. He drowned. Verse 3, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. You cast me into the deep. Jonah doesn't blame the sailors for tossing him overboard. He knows that they were just the agents of God's judgment. He says, you, God, tossed me into the deep. The Jews typically were not sailors. Not many could swim. Most likely, Jonah couldn't swim either. And he bobbed up and down until he says, your waves passed over me, and he sank. All your billows and your waves. Jonah knew who caused the storm, who swamped him with waves. Your billows, your waves. He knew that God was disciplining him and that he deserved it. Psalm 42.7 Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The fact that God was dealing with Jonah is proof that Jonah was truly a child of God because God only disciplines his own children. Hebrews 12, But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. That's a tough lesson to learn, huh? Verse 4, then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I have been cast out of your sight. Isn't that terrifying that you cast out of the sight of God? In chapter 1, we read that Jonah was fleeing from God. He wanted nothing to do with him, and now Jonah has his wish. Jonah reasoned that if having an intimate relationship with God meant he had to go to Assyria and warn the city of people that he hates, then he would rather break his relationship with God. This prophet would rather distance himself from the presence of God than obey. So God gave him his way. Jonah got separated from God. Psalm 31, For I said in my haste, that was bad haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you. I will look again toward your holy temple. 
The Jerusalem temple is where God chooses to dwell on earth. That is where his presence is in Judah. And now that Jonah is separated from God, now he yearns for that sanctuary, that holy temple of God. He has the same hopeful expectation found in the prayers of the Psalms, Psalm 5. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Verse 5. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. The deep closed around me. He's drowning. And as he sank, his hair caught up some seaweed and wrapped it around his head. Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Verse 6. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. The moorings of the mountains. His last thought as he sank is the layers of rocks on the seabed. Likely the land was in sight because in chapter 1 we learn that the sailors rode hard to reach it. So perhaps the sea here is relatively shallow, 60 to 80 feet. Nevertheless, as he sinks down, caught in the seaweed, he experiences his last moments of consciousness. When you turn your back on God, your only direction is down. Its bars close behind me forever. The bars means the very foundation of this world. The earth closed over him. He had hit rock bottom, literally. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. Yet God is merciful, God, and brought him out of the hell, out of forever damnation and destruction. Destruction can be in a physical sense, the loss of his body. The same destruction is also used for the pit, the loss of his soul. Jonah is saying that God brought him out of physical destruction and also out of spiritual destruction. Psalm 30, O oh Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit, down to the abyss. Verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. I remembered. Jewish scholars always say that the remembrance is inherently tied to the covenants of God. God has a number of covenants. There's some more older than this, the Eden co covenants from Garden of Eden, and then the Adamic from, from Adam. Uh, but these are the five that I focused on. So there's the Abrahamic covenant where God said he would bless Abraham and his descendants and all nations would be blessed because of him. This unconditional covenant was based on God's performance to bless. The Mosaic covenant was taken by the people after they exited Egypt and they promised to obey God. This conditional covenant was based on the performance of the people to obey. Additionally, there's the Davidic covenant where God promised David that the Messiah would come from his lineage. This unconditional covenant was based on God's performance to bring the Messiah to earth through the line of David. And God did. Jesus was born. So here they are, the Abrahamic. the Noah. We all know Noah, the Noah covenant where God said he wouldn't flood the earth again and he gave us the rainbow to remember that. Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and then the new covenant, of course, is Jesus. What does it say? It says, on the new covenant, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, from Jeremiah 31, 31. Exodus 2. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. As the people in Egypt cried out in their slavery, God remembered his unconditional covenant with Abraham, and he brought them out of Egypt. In the desert, Moses was always exhorting his people to remember. Remember the goodness of God. Remember his blessings and his provision and also his curses. Always remember the covenants. So here Jonah knows that he personally has no merit in and of itself. But he can remind God of God's unconditional covenant with Abraham. And that's what Jonah is clinging to. This is an unbreakable connection between the covenants of God and the promises of God. Jonah is clinging to that one biblical truth. He has a covenant relationship with God through Abraham, and Jonah claimed that promise. I remembered the Lord. As Jonah thinks, he remembers the promises of God. His thoughts are filled with the Lord, because Jonah's heartfelt prayer reached God in his holy temple. 
Jonah's prayer got God's attention. Psalm 142. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. Psalm 18. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. This was not a temporary dunking in the sea. This was forever in Sheol. But even in Hades, Jonah knew that God could reach him there and save him. Because nobody can save anybody out of Hades, but God can. Psalm 139. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. God is everywhere. My prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Here the reference is to God's holy temple in heaven, not the temple in Jerusalem. The Israelites held these two residences of God to have an inseparable association. 1 Kings 8, 38. Whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people of Israel and spreads out his hands towards his temple, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive an act and give to everyone according to all his ways whose heart you know. For you alone are the hearts of all the sons of men. Verse 8. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Those who regard worthless idols. Jonah is speaking about pagans, probably Nineveh. Pagans follow their own imagination, indulge in their own fantasies, defile themselves with worthless meanderings. Pagans don't know the truth, or they do know, but have deliberately forsaken their loyalty to the one true God. And these are the people that God wants to redeem. They were spiritually hopeless and helpless. God's message is still one of destruction for Nineveh, but they had a chance to change their ways. If they didn't, the result would be God's judgment. An idol, oops, I made a mistake. An idol is anything that distracts us from our worship of God, worship that rightfully belongs to God. And Jonah has a worthless idol. He has one too. His intense dislike of his enemies. He was so concerned for the safety and prosperity of Israel that he refused to bring God's message to Assyria. He had another worthless idol. He was concerned for his reputation. If God spared Nineveh, then perhaps Jonah would be branded as a false prophet whose message was just empty words. For someone who was famous for his prophecy, because he prophesied, we read Jonah and we think he only prophesied to Nineveh, but in actual fact he was a prophet to Israel for, for decades. So, uh, where was I? Oh. So, if, if God spared Nineveh, then perhaps Jonah would be branded a false prophet, whose message was just empty words. For someone who was famous for his prophecies, this would be a devastating knock to his ego. Jonah had prophesied that Israel would reclaim its borders. That was one of his prophecies. So 2 Kings 14, he, King Jeroboam II, who reigned for 41 years, restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamas to the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which is a prophecy, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hepha. So he was famous for his prophecies, and now he's told to go to Nineveh. Perhaps Jonah recognizes that it's not just his enemies that have worthless idols. He has some himself. So Jonah acknowledges God's purpose. Now he understands why God wanted him to go to Nineveh. Now he appreciates his calling as a prophet. God could have called any one of his other prophets to go to Nineveh, but he wanted to teach obedience to the rebellious Jonah. And he did, finally. Psalm 31. I have hated those who regard useless idols, but I trust in the Lord. And so God moved in Jonah's life. Literally, he brought him back from the dead. So in the picture, the very first page that I showed you, here's Obadiah, here's Jonah, and here's King Jeroboam the second, and he's preaching to um, Israel. Well, he preached to Israel, but then in this particular, the book of Jonah is when he is sent to Nineveh and got taken up by a fish. Verse 9. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Back in chapter 1, the sailors were reformed and they came face to face with the God of Israel. They sacrificed and made vows and got committed to Jonah's God. These heathens now knew who was indeed the one true God. Now Jonah reaffirms his vows to God. He will offer sacrifices to God in the temple. And like the psalmist, he will fulfill the vows he made to God. Psalm 66, 
I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. The voice of thanksgiving. Jonah has gone through a transformation. The outcome of his rebellion was death and separation from God. But now he wants to change. And God gave him a second chance. I'm so grateful to God for second chances. God is faithful to his promises. And if we repent and call on his name, then God is merciful. Psalm 116, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Psalm 18, this entire chapter is a song of deliverance by King David. I will pay what I have vowed. So Jonah as a prophet would have taken a vow to follow where God led him. But he didn't. He ran to Tarshish. Now he says he will be obedient. He will go to Nineveh. He will preach to them. He will obey the voice of the Lord. Similarly, God wants this of us, that we listen to God's voice and go where he wants us to go, that we put our will and our plans aside and follow God's will for us. Salvation is of the Lord. This is Jonah's second confessional statement. Remember, his first was that he was a Hebrew, and as such he worshipped only the one true God. And everybody in that region in the known world at the time knew that the Hebrews worshipped only one true God when everybody else had thousands of gods that they worshipped. Jonah doesn't argue that perhaps the punishment did not fit his crime of disobedience. He knows he deserved to die for refusing his divine assignment. He knew that he had no merit on his own. He couldn't claim some wonderful deed that he had done for God. Jonah knew that he had been a rebellious and disobedient servant of the Lord. He knows that he cannot save himself. Nobody on earth can save him because he's in Hades. Only God can save him. Finally, he completely accepts that he sinned and cries to God for mercy. And God granted his salvation. Psalm 3, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. So this is the end of Jonah's prayer from inside the fish. So verse 10, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Here we see again that everybody and everything obeys the word of the Lord. God commands the skies and the land and the seas, and everything in it obeys God. Even finally, Jonah vomited onto dry land. What an ignominious way for the distinguished prophet of God to arrive on shore. The fish vomited him out. And if anyone saw this happen, word would spread rapidly all the way to Nineveh. We can be sure that at this point, Jonah is thoroughly humbled. God grants Jonah a second chance. God doesn't change. He doesn't think, Jonah had a bad, tough time. I'll alter my plans. Uh -uh. God is sovereign. God doesn't change. Jonah does. But what about prayer? Prayer doesn't change God's plan for us. Prayer brings us to an understanding of the purposes of God. We have to change in order to draw nearer to God and in order to follow the plan that God has for our lives. God spoke to the fish. The fish would have had to come right in shore and threaten stranding itself in order to spit Jonah out on dry land. This is the only case in the Bible of a prayer coming from the dead being answered. Jonah is a reformed man. So would I be. Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. This was a song we used to sing. So the key person is not Jonah, not the sailors, not the Ninevites, but God. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible tells only one story, our relationship with him. And God keeps communicating this message to us even though we don't always listen too attentively. How long-suffering is he towards us? The most wonderful aspect of the story is that God is so very, very patient with us. He searches for us 24-7. He calls us back to him continuously. He's eager to forgive us and welcome us under his wings. God is a gracious God. I know from personal experience. You know, I have the same problem as Jonah had, disobedience and rebellion. And I remember at 18 when I graduated from high school in South Africa and the government started for the first time a girls' army and it was going to be, the girls were going to be separate. They weren't in the same army as the boys. And so we had to get permission from our parents. 
um, especially our father, to sign the application. So I went running home. <laughs> I said, Dad, please sign this poem. I want to go to the army. And my father looked at me and he said, Honey, you are so rebellious and so disobedient. And the army doesn't put up with that stuff. They'll just stand you up against the wall and shoot you. So I said, no, 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 I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good. And he said, no, honey, you won't be good. You haven't been good for 18 years. You, the army will not put up with your rebellion. They'll just stand you up against the wall and shoot you. And he wouldn't sign it, and I didn't go. And my friends were all having a grand old time shooting guns and jumping out of planes and riding tanks and stuff. And my father said, uh-uh, he would not sign that document. So God is a gracious God. And this is a, as a Christian, these are still two things that I, I have to really work to not be disobedient, to not be rebellious. You know, like I'll be washing the dishes and God says, I want you to go and pray. And I say, okay, just let me finish the dishes. And God says, that, that's, that's rebellion. That's disobedient. I'm telling you now, go and pray. Not in 20 minutes when you finish cleaning the dishes and finish wiping down the kitchen. Now, I told you now, you're being disobedient. And so that, that's, <laughs> I have to work on that. I'm still working on that. And I'm so, gracious, God, I'm so glad that God is a gracious God. Ten miracles. So, so far we've seen six of the ten. We saw the storm. We saw Jonah, Jonah selected by Lot as the guilty one by, th by casting lots. We saw when they threw him in the sea, the sea suddenly just completely calmed down. There was a great fish came along at the right time and the right place. So Jonah is, is preserved in the belly of the fish, and then he's spat out on dry land. So we've had six of the, the ten miracles so far. So the book of Jonah is not simply about a great fish, mentioned only four times, or a great city, named nine times, or even a disobedient prophet, mentioned 18 times. It's about God. It's about the love and mercy of God. God is mentioned 38 times in this short book. And if you eliminate him, the story wouldn't make sense. The book of Jonah is about the will of God and how we respond to it. So this is the end of episode 3, chapter 2, Jonah in the Fish. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. Repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. Acts 3.19 I came not to call the righteous, says Jesus, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5.32 So thank you for spending this time with me on episode 3. Please follow me to episode 4. And before you go, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Number 6, 24 to 26. Thank you, thank you, thank you for spending this time with me. God bless. Shalom.